Hi, I'm Andy Hatfield with Lessons with Marcel. We're here at IBMA 2023, and we're here with one of my favorite guitar players on earth, and that is uh, Mr. Jake Workman, uh, I think one of the 17 guitar players with Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder. <laughs> yeah, it was about that. But he's the one that, <laughs> he's, he's the one that, that we know and is front and center and, and, and plays all the lead stuff. I just love your playing, uh, first of all, not just for the technical proficiency, which you know we're all interested in, but the way that you put together music at those speeds is really interesting to me. Sure, yeah, well, appreciate and that. So my first question is, I guess, what the heck? <laughs> Take me back, because R Ricky Skaggs, when he started playing bluegrass again in the late 90s and Brian Sutton kind of did something we hadn't really seen, especially as like publicly playing at those tempos and stuff. And then the, the, a lot of people held that, I guess I'll, I'll call it like a chair, like, yeah. like the guitar chair. Tell me about uh, when you started playing with Ricky, how did you get come across that, that job? And then I also want to know, what was the first rehearsal like? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, uh, Cody decided, Cody Kilby decided he was he was going to move on and play with the McCurries full time. And so Ricky uh, was, was asking around. So he, of course, he first asked Cody and Cody mentioned me. And then I think he was on like a recording session with Brian sometime around the same time, asked Brian different conversation, not not with Cody and Cody all, or Brian also um, mentioned me. That's the story I was told. I, yeah. I, I'm honored if that's the case. And so they both mentioned me first. And Ricky said, well, I'm going to check with this guy first then. And he did. And I was just teaching a lesson in, uh, in Sandy, Utah, where I was working at the time, just teaching a guitar lesson, and a little Facebook Messenger message pops up, and it says, Ricky Skaggs, and then it proceeds to say, hey, Jake, I'm looking for a, and that's it. That's as far as the message got on my phone at the moment, right, because I, I hadn't opened it up yet, and I'm just like, uh, I don't even care if all he's going to say is a recommendation or a sub. I'm just, I'm going to talk to Ricky Skaggs, and that's pretty yeah. cool. No, he's saying... I opened it up. I'm looking for a new guitar player. And I'm just like, like my wife had asked me, like, is there any band that would make you move away from Nashville or move away from Salt Lake to go to Nashville? And I said, man, probably the only band that could make me do that would be would be Skaggs. Yeah. And there it came, and it, and it happened. And uh, we, it's it's been a long long story here, but we we've uh, yeah we moved to Nashville after about about eight months of playing with him, and then we ended up during the pandemic moving back to Utah, and that's yeah. where we're at now. And I'm just making it work really well. Yeah. Long distance, but. Uh, but yeah, man, uh, so that's how it came about. And um, so that was that was early November of 2015, 2015. And then early to mid-December or so of, of that same year, uh, I, I showed up and all in the same night was, I guess we'll call it a rehearsal. It was a, you know, we got to the Opry early and the Opry, oh, gosh. The Opry was at the Ryman Auditorium because they do that in the winter months. They take it back to the Ryman. So your first gig with Ricky was on the on So the, yeah, the, I was not, I was, I was, yeah, I was playing with Ricky Skaggs. I was playing the Grand Ole Opry and I was playing the Ryman Auditorium all in one pop with maybe 25 minutes of jamming before rehearsing, whatever you want to call it. And he just, you know, he sent me a set list of, of songs, you know, and I, I mean, I've listened to them for years. I've, yeah. I've just worshiped all the Kentucky Thunder records and jammed to them. So I kind of knew a lot of the stuff, but in the level of detail that he might want, maybe not. So I practiced up for that month and I didn't know exactly what we'd play at the Opry those nights, but I, um, yeah, I came pretty ready. We, I, I think we did Blue Night and uh, Black Eyed Susie, Uncle Penn, Highway 40 Blues. I think those are the, yeah. we did two nights of the Opry, two songs each night. And I think yeah. that was the weekend and I was like, oh, I was ready on those, you know, I, I knew those were gonna come up. So I, I, had, I had rehearsed them a bunch myself, but then all we did backstage is run them. And he's like, you sound great, man, it's gonna be fun. And I was that's like, it. that's it. But then getting out there and it was also my first time, like seriously, a first time using ear monitors. And I had some molds made and, and stuff in the meantime before this first Opry. And so it was just weird though, man. I was, you guys plug in or are you all, all on mic? I'm, we're on my, I'm on a mic, but I'm also plugging in. And then we kind of mix the two. At the Opry, they have, you, they have me plug in, um, but I don't have any control. I guess I could bring my board and I do sometimes, but that back then I didn't bring anything. I just plugged into whatever they had direct. Yeah, it wasn't the greatest pickup sound, and then they, whoever's doing the sound, was blending that with the actual mic in front, and that's what we do in our shows. Though we're we have our own sound guys, and we're much more self-contained and in, in control of how how good it sounds, and it does sound really good. Sometimes on like louder festival venues, we'll we'll crank the pickup side more, and it's the K and K Trinity yeah. microphone setup, and and that combined with my uh, Grace Design um, Felix is a really good. It's giving us really great tone, so we're relying on that a lot for louder shows some of the indoor auditorium things where you can really hear well we might rely more on the mic in front you know from a 
guitar player's perspective, I'm wondering if there are musical lines that work better at tempo, at that, those tempos. Are there things that you do that the way you put notes together work better at faster speeds? Like yeah. even something as simple as this, like like it's really hard for me to cross pick at a fast speed, but oh, that's like something. Me too. Are there just like musically things that work better at fast speed? In general, for me, I, I, I always talk to my students about, you know, trying to not always use uh, real linear lines, you know, in general. But then we talk okay. about speed, and I sometimes change my tune slightly. I'll say, be as melodic as you can. And what I mean by a linear line is, you know, half steps and whole steps, going from this fret to this fret or this fret to this fret a lot. Like, there's neighboring or two frets apart distances. Yeah. If you do that too much, it does sound like you're, you're hashing out scales to an extent. Right, right, but right. But you can still do that really tastefully if you place on strong beats or moments that you deem a strong beat. It, can, it could be an offbeat if you want to accent kind of in a different place. It's up to you, but if you kind of strategically place your tensions and resolves, meaning chord tones, so G, B, and D would be like your, your chord tones of that G chord, right? Then there's tensions everywhere in between. Okay. Every other note that's not a root three or a five is a tension of some kind. And you're really thinking about oh, that yeah. then. So you're really thinking I mean, of, in terms of like, you know, what we'd call theory or whatever, like you know that you know what notes are in the chord, yeah. and you know when you're there, and you know when you're yeah. not there, and you're finding ways to get back there. But I've experimented so much now that those things are, well, they're Just muscle automatic. memory. Yeah, I'm not like thinking that hard when I'm playing Black Eyed Susie or whatever. At, now, at 180. I'm, I'm letting muscle memory kick in, you have to. But when I've created lines or just experiment, I love playing, one of my favorite things to do is just play really slow and kind of in the wild, just create cool combinations of notes. And then, yeah, I'll test them out and see if they can also happen fast. Because a cross picking type lick, I don't do as much of uh, at fast tempos. I'll stay and really milk this string and then I'll go to this string and milk it. And yeah. again, trying to not play too linear, like in a boring way, but trying to, again, place those, those accent points, the chord tones mixed with the tensions, kind of put them in smart places so that when you are you know, playing linearly, it's still very musical and it's bringing out the chord. Do you have stuff that's worked out? You like, like when you play, do you, do you have breaks that are worked out or do you have spots that you hit or do you have licks that are worked out or I mean, what's I, your approach? It depends, I've, I've changed, it. when I first joined the band, I, I worked up a lot of solos so that I had something in the tank. Yeah. I've come to realize that I'm, as I watch other players and whatever, I'm, I'm actually, I'm okay with somebody playing a little messier yeah. because they tried something new. And you can feel the energy of when they're, they're literally playing in the moment and be, that's, that's special, they're capturing a moment. And, if you always play the same solo over and over again, I don't know, the band knows what to expect, you know what to expect, it's too just, yeah, just punching numbers or something. I want it. To, I want you to, I, what I've learned through playing with Ricky, honestly, because he plays from the heart better than anybody I know, yeah. what I've learned is that you need to kind of seize that moment and how are you, you know, ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? What do I think right now would enhance this rendition of this tune? Fast or slow, whatever the song is, I, I've, I've really tried to make it a point to not always play the same thing. Now I've played, many of these tunes so many times that muscle memory still kicks in and I'll go to some of the same licks, but they might just yeah. be in a different order. Yeah. Things like that. I try and play in the moment as much as I can. It's, it's much more impressive to me and much more musical and exciting to hear when, when I see players doing that um, rather than always canning their licks. But you might also be asking just about, do I have like stock things that I... Sure. I mean, I definitely do. I have my favorite licks. I have... I used to practice what I call speed bursts where I just take five notes and go like... Da -da -da -da, down up down up down and just okay. whatever the whatever the little run was or piece of a run that I was working on I'd work on that five notes till it was real clean at the high tempo and then maybe I'd go to the next five and go da -da 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 -da, and then I'd go get all ten of them together or whatever right and uh, and get and and then all of a sudden you can't really tell where one speed burst began and, and ended versus another they kind of all run together in this hopefully nice creamy line that's maybe covering four measures worth of space yeah. or whatever right and so, but it started out as just little chunks. And so you could say that each one of those little chunks is a small piece of muscle memory, combination of movements here, hopefully with melodic reasoning. And I won't promise yeah. that that's 100% always the case, but as much as I can make it, yeah. Who's your favorite electric guitar player? Jeez, man, I don't, I don't even know, because there's, there's so many. Well, who's, just, who's your favorite? Like, I mean, you into metal and stuff? Because there's, there's uh, some shreddies. Yeah, 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 but I got, I got more, it was more into like the, uh, the, the melodic rock. You know, when I was in high school, I loved Journey and Van Halen. Okay. So Neil Sean, Eddie Van Halen. But still, like, these explosive players. Yeah, explosive players. I did like I did My like favorite the was uh, Vernon Reed from Living Color. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, that, that, yeah. that got me interested in guitar when yeah. I heard that. I, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. okay, I'll, I'll talk right down to earth in a language everybody yeah, can exactly. understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And lately I've been into, you know, I've really been, I got into uh, uh, Dan Huff. He's a producer in Nashville. I yeah. don't know him. 
But he played he played with Giant, right? He, he, and the, his his melodic his sense of melody. And he played on the Glory of Love. Did he? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And he he's just it's so tasty. So I've listened to his stuff, and I know it's super '80s, a lot of whammy bar, and I, I'm fascinated by how you use those to make melody too. Like, Do you have a whammy bar at home? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been I've been. What is it on? What what guitar is it it's on? It's on a a couple of on my Sirs. I've got a couple Sir okay. guitars, and I just I love them. Honestly, my 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 passion lately has been, and this is fairly lately, you know, the last six months or so, but I've been really heavy into playing electric. Okay. But nobody knows that. I don't post much about it. I don't, no. you know, I don't post much anymore, period. But but uh, I, pr I teach on acoustic and I play acoustic for work, you could say. I yeah. love it. I come to IBMA and jam acoustic. But when I'm home with some free time, I'm, I'm often just noodling electric ideas. And it's changing changing my left hand or helping my left hand, I should say, Okay. in everything because it's, it's a different way of, you know, there's more slurs here. Uh, there, it's just a different way of thinking about melody. And uh, and then add in the whammy bar and to sustain. play some of your melody and sustain. You can have long notes, unlike yeah. sometimes on here you, you have to do something to keep them going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's like it's it's been interesting to yeah just to look at that. Look, I think uh, not that I'm burning out on bluegrass, but I've just done it for so long and studied it so hard that I, I guess you could say that I, I could use just a, a hair of a break once in a while. You know, I, I love it that, to death. I think that that's something that we all do as guitar players yeah. is get another guitar. I, I think it. Most and even when I look at like the beginnings of bluegrass music with Bill Monroe and and uh, Earl Scruggs and stuff, it's clear Earl Scruggs was listening to something besides just um, you know the banjo players around the corner. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that he's listening to Benny Goodman, and it's clear that Bill Monroe is very familiar with the blues and, and rockabilly and all, and and all these things. So I think it's part of the tradition and it's part of the exploration we have yeah. to do that. another question about Ricky Skaggs yeah. band though because I want to take you back to one of the greatest days in my life and that was when I saw you on TV oh, <laughs> and that that was I know what you're talking the about. CMT awards so basically if you haven't seen the video of this we'll post a link live on national TV when people watch TV Ricky Skaggs band gets up and I think he's getting a, a, a like a lifetime achievement award or something yeah and Instead of playing his hits, instead of playing Highway 40 Blues, instead of playing Cry My Heart or Eyes Over You, yeah. instead of playing these hits, he comes out and I think it was Black Eyed Susie or Pig and a, I think it was Black, Black Eyed, Eyed Susie at I'm sure 182 and a half. It was it was fast. And at some point he just goes, "Take it, Jake." And Jake took it. And and <laughs> uh, you could you could feel the energy in the room of all these people that are not into bluegrass and it's not their thing and people flipped out and i i was one of them flipping out at home tell me about that moment and how were you scared and 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 how did it feel to pull that off i'll tell you that was that's still i mean a, a, a huge benchmark in my career at this point like i i think about that one once in a while and i'm just like i can't believe we did that we played freaking just killer nasty fast bluegrass for the world essentially and it just it was just like a minute and 20 seconds of chaos really great chaos and then it went by so fast but i'll tell you when we got up there i mean in preparation for that i just i didn't want to be nervous i just wanted to be confident i, I talked to myself about hey this is going to be on national tv what do i see myself doing at other shows that i don't want to be doing you know maybe i need to stand up straighter maybe i need to not tap my foot because sometimes that just looks a little like you know like yeah. yeehaw you know maybe maybe not tap my foot purposely just act like you know all the time is inside you not you know showing that off it's kind of a it's kind of a weird thing that I, I think about so i thought of all these things like what can i do to just look look sharp and 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 have a good show and feel good inside when i'm playing and i think standing up straight and letting my shoulders drop was one of the biggest things i told myself anyway it's just some mental game stuff right because okay. it's kind of like a bigger bigger show we were backstage and brad paisley's just goofing around and like he was he was he was just coming off or getting warmed up or something and he was just passing he was like playing a lick and i played a lick back at him you know i'm okay. like is this real? Is this real? You know? And so we go out there and I could kind of see around the corner and see just how many people, you know, like a, a packed Bridgestone arena. I'm just like, this is not real. Um, I just, I said a little prayer probably in my heart. Yeah. Just like, please play well, you know, that type of thing. Got up there and man, it was like t about 15 seconds in. I think people were like, okay. And they started clapping like, this is cool. And then 
about by the second, like the first, the first solos, it was the, the fiddle and banjo solos came before the guitar solo. And I think that the people just like, were like, holy cow, this is cool. This is awesome. And that place, it was electric in there. I watched that video and it reminds me of that feeling. Yeah. And it's awesome watching the video. I, I, cause it, yeah, it just, it's special, but being in there can't, I can't be described. It's, it was so electric inside me. Like I was so, and when it was done, I was so relieved because that's, I knew that was going to be recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. I mean, the whole world's seeing it. And I just, I did not want to screw it up. Right? right. So that was a time where did I, did I work on my solo a little bit and kind of tidy up some ideas? You bet. You okay. bet. I wasn't winging it completely there. Okay. Um, Maybe the, I, I know it wasn't note for note, but it was it was stuff that's in muscle memory that I knew I could nail pretty pretty well. Right, right, right. And um, but man, it was so electric and just the the seeing the people and you're in the front few rows are all the famous celebrities, you know, and they're down there loving it and rocking out and thinking it was so cool, you know. It's like man, that's pretty awesome. I remember Russ said that he winked at Nicole Kidman, so you know, <laughs> what a, wait, wait a take, second, t- take that. Russ winked at Nicole Kidman. That's what he said. I'm calling Bethany. <laughs> I think she knows. <laughs> he just he was just being a dork, but but yeah, that's 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 yeah, good good times. But man, it's so cool. We got backstage. We were we were just so pumped because we we knew we we felt good. And Ricky did. He went. He kept going. He did three little pieces. He went and played with Keith Urban, and then went and played with Brad Paisley. But it's really special too that he would see that as an opportunity to 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 put the band out there. Yeah. I mean, he could have come out. Everybody would have been happy with Highway 40 Blues. Yeah. Basically. Absolutely. Just just straight ahead. Yeah. yeah. Everybody would happen he, to be a country boy. He and really wanted, his roots are bluegrass, and he's from from day one honored his bluegrass fathers. Yeah. And uh, he, 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 you know, he also is proud of Kentucky Thunder. He's yeah. always, he's always been proud of those bands, and every configuration of this band has been incredible. Just amazing. And uh, so, you know, there, there's, and there, yeah, you could never say that one version was better than the other, because they're all just killer players, and have their own flair, you know, when we get a different fiddle player, they bring their own thing. When I yeah. came in, I didn't sound just like Cody or Brian, but I brought my own thing and play rhythm my own way. I think there's a there's a Kentucky Thunder vibe that that Ricky is all about. And you listen to his records, you can capture it. And it's just, there's something about the energy and the minor five chords all the time and the way he does intros right. and outros and the format there of the songs. There are a lot of minor five chords. There's a ton of minor five chords, but you know, he grew up, he grew up, you know, play, playing with, a Stan, with Ralph Stanley and then he knew Bill Monroe, he knew Flat and Scruggs. He, he knew all the greats and then he just took his edge to all those songs and you capture that when you start listening to his records especially with the intent to join his band you, you noticed even more things yeah and you start really studying them in headphones and you study them on stereo speakers in the car What age did you start playing guitar? 13. I was late. I was late compared to some. That's, yeah. that's how old I was when I started okay, yeah. playing. Awesome. Did you get it right away? Were you around, what, what was it, bluegrass right away? Or was no, it something I wasn't, different? I was, no, I, I, I grew up listening to all my dad's old CDs and records, you know, Boston and, okay. and uh, the Beatles I got into first probably. And then, yeah, Boston and all that 80s stuff. And you're from Utah? I'm from Utah. And where did you find bluegrass in Utah? So that's the thing. Uh, about a year after playing guitar, a year and a half, my parents got me a banjo for Christmas, but they didn't even know what they were doing. They right. didn't know. They weren't familiar with it. It's not like they were fans of bluegrass. They didn't even know what it was hardly. How many strings did it have on it? It had five. Okay. It was a five-string Deering okay. Sierra banjo, and it was a good starter banjo for okay. sure. And I took some lessons from a guy in Salt Lake and uh, John Cavanaugh. Maybe you've seen the Cavanjo banjo pickups. Okay. He's, he's the guy. He's, okay. I think he's moved away from teaching and now he just makes banjo pickups. Anyway, super nice guy. He's often here at the Deering booth. Maybe he was down there. I didn't see him. But yeah, I took lessons from him for about three months and then I kind of, and I honestly at that time though, I was like, I just want to get back to playing guitar. I'm just, I don't want my parents to waste their money on lessons or the banjo. So I better practice it, learn Ballad of Jed Clampett and just get that over with so I can. So did, did you want a banjo or your parents just decided? I joked about it like one time. I joked about it like one time. I don't even like, know why. Like, I think I want a banjo and, and they're like, kid wants a banjo. And they, yeah, and they just they just went for it, I guess. And uh, they wanted, they love a good one. They loved that I was taken up to the guitar. I was really in love with the guitar uh, and I was playing it a lot, you know, learning just Beatles songs and classic rock stuff that my yeah. teacher was teaching me. I was not into bluegrass at all at this point and uh, didn't even know what it was. And then they got me a banjo and that kind of segued me into bluegrass guitar through going to a couple festivals that were recommended to us and realizing, hey, this is pretty cool. And the jamming was what was cool. Rock jamming is not really an easy, easily done thing. Yeah. You gotta all find a wall outlet and plug in your amp and it's just like pain in the butt. So 
bluegrass jamming it was so fun and i was like wow that's cool and then i saw josh williams at grass valley california probably 2002 i saw him and i would have been 14 and a half or so maybe 15, almost 15 maybe that's when i really like saw wow bluegrass can be played on a guitar and it's freaking awesome yeah that's like that's like the rock and roll i've been listening to but on acoustic instruments and okay that, josh will do that too yeah too. he's awesome he's, he's man. really terrific and so, so I had, I had, I, t I even talked to him at the booth when Rhonda, he was playing with Rhonda, and I talked to him at the booth. I said, "Man, what scales are you using?" Like, God, the dumbest question ever, because scales are so awful if you think in scales. Uh, but yeah, I, so he was like, "Man, I don't even know. I, uh, I uh, just do what's on the records, which was Brian, probably a lot right, of Brian right, right. stuff in there, and I just do what was on the records, and then do my own thing, whatever, whatever comes to mind. Listen to a lot of Tony, of course, you know, and that type of thing. I'm just like." But what scales do you use? You know, it, right? But, but, I was, but my mind was too. But seriously, yeah, my mind what was. What scale are you using? Yeah, exactly. Because my mind was too thinking there was always a formula for everything you do. If something sounded cool, there was like this mathematical combination, or I, I got to study. I got to right, study right, right. what that was. Sometimes you just play from the heart, and you play a wrong note, but it's not wrong because it, the tension of that note was released in the perfect way to where it's just yeah. satisfying. There's no yeah. such thing as a wrong note. All twelve notes are an option all the time. Okay, check this out. Okay. All 12 notes. All 12 notes exist in, one in that. But would you call that a G lick? Yeah. I absolutely would. I would call that a G lick. Because the tension and the, the chord tones and the tensions release in the right places to still bring out the triad of G. Yeah. But all the tensions, are there. all 12 notes are in there. There's not a note that didn't exist in there. Will Ricky let you play that on stage? Oh, absolutely. Okay. You know what I've been doing lately on one of his tunes? Uh, Ancient Tones. Uh, it's, one, it's one he hasn't recorded. He's got a record called Ancient Tones. But okay. now he has a tune. We need to record it. Uh, I won't play his melody as much as I'll just kind of play it. So I'll just play okay. it just for two seconds here. When it gets to, you'll, you'll know what I'm doing. I'm going to okay. play this this A flat. It's the flat nine, right? Right. But I'll play it over the G. Okay. And it's just it's kind of just like something like that. So I might do something like. Uh, whatever right and this little right it's if you resolve if i just land out of there out of nowhere just land on that no note, no, no you're gonna think oh what the heck that he's, he's playing it wrong it's gonna you know that's when you can maybe legit call but it you, wrong but, just, but somehow you made that work if you yeah who, who says i can't play that note? nobody right. says if i do this right. sure that works too and i'll do that sometimes i'll what if you snuck this in? it's well, it's I'll, cool I'll, it's dirty there and there's stuff like that in bluegrass. When I, when I listen to Bill Monroe's music, there's times I can't tell whether he's in major or minor, right. or he's playing minor against major. And I, I'm like, I honestly can't tell what the chord is supposed to be here. And I've heard it done differently. I mean, I feel like, and I, I don't think he was a schooled musician. Sure. I mean, I don't think there was a church organ around or something that he could have learned the chords on. Yeah. You know, I think he's hearing it, and yeah. I mean, if it sounds good, it he's is playing good. from the heart. He's, he's playing, playing from the he's heart. Playing from the heart, and uh, and sometimes the notes that you know other guys would expect to avoid because they learned a scale, and that scale didn't have that fret in it's it. It's got so a rule. It's got a rule. I can't use that note. And I used to be that way, you know. So I was right. asking Josh, "What scales do you use, man?" And just like, like, what notes do I need to avoid? Is what that question could be rephrased as. Okay. What notes should I avoid? If you think of it that way, and the answer needs to be none. Don't avoid anything. Don't Realize avoid that any note is possible at any time. It's up to you to decide if it's in context, and it's up to you to decide if you have the skills to get out of its tension. To get out of it, okay. Yeah. If you can get out of it, it's a good note. That's cool, man. If you can't get out of it, it may, yeah, it may not quite settle in your ears as much. You might not dig it. You might hear it back and go, yeah, I would, I'd love to take that note back. We all do that, but yeah. any note can be gotten out of it. I'm not going to say that I'm a genius as how, how to get out of every note. There's always a path of least resistance, right. you know, up the, only this many frets or down only this many frets to a, a chord tone. But is it is it gonna you gonna get there and you know is it gonna still feel weird? Is there too much space between them? I don't know. You you have to decide for yourself and a trial and error. I make mistakes every day because I'm always trying different things. If you don't make mistakes when you practice, you're not practicing.
every bluegrass guitar player at some point is faced with the legacy of Tony Rice. Oh yeah. Okay, and even if it's just the, I don't hear you play a lot of Rice stuff, but I think anytime you play a flat five down to a four, I think you're playing something that, that's inspired I mean, by Tony yeah, Rice. absolutely. And then I think that he set the standard for tone. Do you play any, did you study Rice? Man, I listened to him. I did very little uh, transcribing, very little, almost none. And I, I, I know that's a, a, a very uh, like controversial topic in a sense, like transcribe, transcribe, transcribe is what some people say. I actually, the reason I sound maybe unique, I hope that people hear me and recognize, hey, that's Jake's playing. Yeah. I don't want to be like, oh, it just sounds like somebody that's really good at being Greer or really good at being Tony or I love all these guys and I believe in listening. Listening needs to be the key word, not transcribing. If you want to transcribe, you totally can. It's not hurting you. Right. But I think you can better use your time, spending that time and effort into creating your own sound and style. So listen to Tony like crazy. I did. His note choices, his phrasing, all those flavors, everything I'm hearing soaked into my brain, whether I knew it or not. A lot of that was right. seeping in there. Whether it's active just listening, listening to the music. or passive listening. Either way, yeah. It would just it would just it would soak in there. And yeah, sure, I'd learn some of the tunes because he's playing standard tunes. And there might be this one lick that I'm like, ah, hey, what's he doing there? But I can't play like Tony. Right. I mean, no. I know. I know. I know. I know some of his licks slowly, and I can, or I can play them my way with a couple changes or a different position on the neck or whatever, maybe. But I'm not a Tony player. I right. play all the same notes in a different way, and that's what you have to do to be to distinguish yourself and to be anybody. If you're a clone of anyone, you might be a great clone. But I just, I just think the coolest. My favorite guitar players are the original ones. Look at Julian Lodge. Right. You know, Chris Eldridge, who's right. just in here. Right. Like those guys. I mean, you can hear you can hear you know influences in them. I can definitely hear Tony and, and Chris's plan, but I hear right. Chris. Right. I hear Chris, and that's what I love about it. So that's we can, what I love about bluegrass in general is that there's a high value placed on individuality. Yeah, and that that really speaks to me. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what's so magical about it. We're yeah. all finding our own sound. We all have our own hands. I can't play like you, right. dude. I love what you do. I can't Thanks. play like you. My gosh, it's it's crazy. And so. But I, but I can listen and be like, oh, that's cool. You, 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 right. you used uh, some kind of chord arpeggio or whatever to enhance a melody. And it's because you do a lot of that, a right. lot of arpeggiations. And things. I love that. So it's like, so that idea, that concept soaked into my brain. So I just keep that in the back of my head. And then I, I don't know, I'll go play a, a tune and try and have some kind of deeper thinking uh, arpeggio within the line or something. Maybe I'm playing Wheelhouse tonight. There's a... Right, okay. I don't know, I I, I'm not it. saying this is coming from you exactly, but you know, I just know you do things that use a lot of chord tones and whatnot, yeah, so. So it's root five, two, three, right? And then I'm thinking, okay. Or what if I just reverse it? <laughs> oh, there's a Tony thing right there. So all the same notes are in there as any of us are using. There's only 12 notes, but you can string them. them together so many ways and sound like you, and everyone needs to find that, I think. Yeah, buddy. That was great, man. That was really fun. <laughs> awesome. That's really fun. Thank you for taking the time here at IBMA, and thanks for IBMA for hosting this. And I'm so glad you came by. And uh, absolutely, we'll look for you with Kentucky Thunder and um, and all that. So we'll be thanks out there. a lot, man. Yeah, man. Thanks, Andy. Take it easy. <laughs>